Hello and welcome to Future Self Dreaming. My name is Carlos Kukulkan. In the last two presentations, I outlined a series of synchronous events that led me to become involved with a body of work known as the template, a holonomic model of transcendence. These involved messages from, reminders about, and interactions with a transcendent level of human consciousness that we may refer to as the bird tribes or the collective human oversoul, which are other linguistic terms for what I'm referring to as our higher selves or our future self-dreaming. I outlined an experience that I had of ego dissolution that had been triggered by interacting with sacred geometry and watching a movie called Revolver that has a transpersonal theme about an experience of a man undergoing the process of ego dissolution and transcendent liberation. As described during this occurrence, over several intense days of being in a very altered state, at one point, I was guided to go on a bushwalk to a location filled with pine trees that had many of the psychoactive red and white psilocybin mushrooms named the Amanita muscaria that were growing beneath them. Shortly thereafter, a friend had introduced me to a book called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross by John Allegro, and when I opened it, I discovered a chapter about the relationship between the Amanita muscaria mushroom and the morning star. Now, you may realize why this reference to the morning star had a particular significance to me if you watched earlier presentations that I've given about an interaction that I had with the morning star as a child and how in later life this guiding light led to my involvement with the ancient Egyptian mystery, mystery school known as the ancient secret of the flower of life as well as further guidance by the morning star triggering a series of synchronicities that led to initiations in Mexico into a lineage of Toltec shamanism and the mysteries of Kundalini activation in the cult of Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan. In this presentation, I wish to share some more of the information I discovered about the relationship that Venus, otherwise known as the Morning Star, has with magic mushrooms, as well as how these are related to the concept of ego death and Kundalini awakening. I'll be further referencing the work of Joseph Campbell, Carl Jung, Stanislav Grof, Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary, and Terence McKenna in relation to these concepts and the use of psychedelics, sacred geometry, and Kundalini, Kundalini awakening in the process of ego dissolution. So to begin with, it might be helpful to define ego death. So I'm going to use some information found on Wikipedia as well as from a book called My Undoing, an inquiry into the deconstruction of the self by Ed Gerardy that states, Ego death is an experience that reveals the illusory aspect of the ego, sometimes undergone by mystics, shamans, monks, psychologists, and others interested in exploring the depths of the mind. The practice of ego death as a deliberately sought mystical experience and in some ways is said to overlap with, but nevertheless distinct from, traditional teachings concerning enlightenment associated with Nirvana in Buddhism or Moksha in Hinduism, which might perhaps be better understood as transcendence of the notion that one even has any actual non-illusory ego and which, uh, with which to experience death in the first place. Many methods, practices, or experiences may induce this state, including prayer, sleep deprivation, fasting, meditation practice, ingestion of psychedelic drugs, or through the use of an isolation tank. It is suggested that individuals experiencing depersonalization may also claim to have had an ego death, although it may be construed for deeper psychological issues. An ego death is said to be characterized as the perceived loss of boundaries between self and environment, a sense of the loss of control, the loss of the accustomed feeling of existing as a personal agent. This perceived loss of boundaries between self and environment is said to be experienced through a sensation that one is the whole universe and therefore there is no need to differentiate the I from the universe or by simply acknowledging that the I does not exist. Many users of psychedelics like psilocybin, LSD and DMT report experiences of ego death uh, along with other mystical experiences common with psychedelic substances. This becomes apparent in the study of psychedelic reports where themes related to dying and mortality, transcendence and expansion of consciousness are commonly observed. 
So as mentioned in my very first presentation when introducing future self-dreaming, the reason that I'm sharing many of my own experiences of spiritual awakening, ego death, initiations, and encounters with non-ordinary reality is in the hope of introducing those of you who are viewing these presentations to maps of consciousness that have been developed by psychologists encoded into spiritual and religious practices of ancient traditions and passed down through mystical teachings and mystery schools. Having reference to these maps can help us to come to terms with challenging experiences related to the process of spiritual emergence that not everyone will be able to relate to or have an understanding of. Those maps that have been most helpful for me personally in navigating through or coming to terms with the integration of experiences that I've had have been those presented by psychologists the likes of Carl Jung and Stanislav Grof, the great mythologist Joseph Campbell, and psychedelic pioneers such as Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary, and Terence McKenna. All of these maps are related to the process of shamanic death and rebirth, which are highlighted in the stages of the great monomyth described by Joseph Campbell as the hero's journey. However, as the saying goes, the map is not the territory, and as helpful as these are, having descriptions of experiences are not the experiences themselves. Although the peak of these experiences may be filled with ecstatic rapture, bliss and love beyond comprehension and imagination, there are also experiences of the dark night of the soul that can be overwhelming, frightening and, con and confusing. There is no going around these experiences. You must navigate through them and integrate the shadow material that surfaces along the path. They cannot remain simply at the level of cognitive thought as they are purely experiential. Experiencing ego death is essentially a complete loss of subjective self-identity. During this process, there is an encounter of a deep and profound merging with a transcendent other. The term ego death is used in various intertwined contexts with related meanings. As mentioned, three of these contexts being psychology, mythology and the psychedelic experience. Now, in Jungian psychology, the synonymous term psychic death is used, which refers to a fundamental transformation of the psyche. In Carl Jung's publications, The Archetypes and the Collective Unconscious, as well as Psychology and Alchemy, he describes that an alchemical unification of archetypal opposites has to be reached during a process of conscious suffering, in which consciousness dies and is then resurrected. Jung called this process the transcendent function, which leads to a more inclusive consciousness. In death and rebirth mythology, ego death is a phase of self-surrender and transition, as described in Joseph Campbell in his research uh, on the recurrent theme in world mythology in the hero's journey. In comparative mythology, ego death is the second phase of Joseph Campbell's description of the hero's journey, which includes a phase of separation, transition and incorporation. The second phase is a phase of self-surrender and ego death, whereafter the hero returns to enrich the world with his discoveries. Campbell describes the basic theme as follows. A hero ventures forth from the world of common day into a region of supernatural wonder. There he finds fabul fabulous forces that are encountered and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. This journey is based on the archetype of death and rebirth in which the false self is surrendered and the true self emerges. In psychedelic culture, Timothy Leary, Ralph Metzner, Metzner and Richard Alpert define ego death or ego loss as they call it in the book The Psychedelic Experience. They explain it as part of the symbolic experience of death in which the old ego must die before one can be spiritually reborn. The term was used to describe the death of the ego in the first phase of an LSD trip in which a complete transcendence of the self occurs. The psychedelic experience is a manual based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead, a Buddhist text that was written as a guide for navigating the process of death, the bardo and rebirth. 
This book is meant to be used as a guide on how to properly handle experiences of ego death while undergoing the psychedelic experience. According to the authors, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a key to the innermost recesses of the human mind and a guide for initiates and for those who are seeking the spiritual path of liberation. They construed the effect of LSD as a stripping away of ego defenses, finding parallels between the stages of death and rebirth in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the stages of psychological death and rebirth which Leary had identified during his research. Again, according to the authors, it is one of the oldest and most universal practices for the initiate to go through the experience of death before he can be spiritually reborn. Symbolically, he must die to his past and to his old ego before he can take his place in the new spiritual life into which he has been initiated. In my research and experience, it is the work of Stanislav Grof who best synthesizes components of all of these areas of psychology, mythology and psychedelics to elaborate on elements that explain the experience of and function of ego death. Stanislav Grof has researched the effects of psychedelic substances, in particular LSD. Uh, this is one of his books called LSD, Doorways to the Numinous. Uh, as, as well as inducing these effects by non-pharmacological means, Grof uh, developed a cartography of the psyche based on his clinical work with psychedelics, which described basic types of experiences that become available to the average person when using psychedelics or various powerful non-pharmacological ex experiential techniques such as holotropic breathwork that he, uh, he formulated. According to Groff, traditional psychology, uh, psychiatry and psychotherapy use a model of the human personality that is limited to biography and the individual consciousness as described by the likes of Freud. This model is inadequate to describe the experiences which result from the use of psychedelics and the use of powerful techniques which activate and mobilize deep unconscious and superconscious levels of the human psyche. In several of his books, he describes what are called perinatal matrices, which are experiences encountered in the womb prior to being born and he recognizes that much of what dies in the process of ego death later in life is basically a paranoid attitude towards the world which reflects the negative experiences uh, of the subject during childbirth. So I'm going to return to this map of perinatal matrices developed by Stanislav Grof in a future presentation to describe an experience of rebirth I had when using the psychedelic plant medicine ayahuasca, as well as those that I've had spontaneously emerge from holotropic breath work. Much of the unresolved buildup of pain, tension, anxiety, and feelings of impending catastrophe that are experienced during the birth process as a baby can be continually looping and cycling through a person's nervous system until the energetic system is resolved in what may be perceived as an ego death. So having just outlined some of the psychological, mythological, and psychedelic maps related to ego death, let me return to when I had the experience of ego death that I described in the last presentation. This was an experience that I largely attributed to having been triggered due to communing with sacred geometric configurations, triggering the movement of Kundalini through the biocircuitry of my body, in collaboration with the transpersonal themes of ego death that had been cabalistically encoded by the movie producer Guy Ritchie in his movie Revolver. These were all synchronistically weaved together by my future self-dreaming. Now, although I'm going to be referring to the use of plant medicines as a means for initiating a psychedelic experience and the resultant ego dissolution and potential energetic and psychological resolution that can occur, I want to highlight that there are many ways to initiate these experiences without psychedelic compounds, such as breath work, craniosacral therapy, depth psychology, and a multitude of other means. And as I will elaborate upon further in future presentations, the reverse engineering of the psychedelic experience and the accessing of states of superconsciousness can be achieved naturally through communing with sacred geometry and the awakening of Kundalini, leading to the resolution of energetic tensions within the body. 
At the time of the ego dissolution experience that occurred for me whilst living in Melbourne, I had never taken a psychedelic compound or psychoactive plant medicine in my life, uh, other than smoking cannabis as a teenager. As described in the earlier presentation, during several days of experiencing a wildly altered state, the consciousness that I was collaborating with led me to an area filled with the red and white fly agaric Amanita muscaria mushrooms. This encounter would herald that these fungi were later to become a plant ally as they had been for many a shaman in times past. It wasn't actually until I was 34 that I accidentally had my first encounter with the psychedelic plant medicine psilocybin found in magic mushrooms, which I will describe at a later date. And when I did, I realized how incredibly similar many of the characteristics of journeying beyond the boundaries of self-identity into a transpersonal realm with this substance were to that which had been triggered uh, for me by sacred geometry in the movie Revolver and the Kundalini activation. What I later discovered was that the exogenous ingestion of plants have the same components and transitory stages associated with ego death as the encounter that had been endogenously triggered for me. These components including, uh, included surrendering beyond any illusory control into a non-stop state of laughter combined with an Alice in Wonderland style of paradoxical perception and auditory channel that had opened in a seeming direct communication with my higher self and discovering a transcendent consciousness that inspired awe and wonder. So during that encounter that I had, the consciousness that I'd been collaborating with also led me, uh, that had led me on this journey to discover these mushrooms, afterwards also clearly pointed out the relationship that the mushrooms have to the morning star in this book that I mentioned earlier by John Allegro called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, a study of the nature and origins of Christianity within the fertility cults of the, ear, uh, the ancient Near East. This is a 1970 book about the linguistics of early Christianity and the fertility cults of the ancient Near East. Its cover reads, where did God come from? What do the Bible stories really tell us? Who or what was Jesus Christ? This book challenges everything we think we know about the nature of religion, the ancient fertility cult at the heart of Christianity, the living power of cultic rites and symbols, the sacred mushroom as the emblem and embodiment of divinity, the secret meaning of biblical myths, the language of religion that links us to our ancestors. The sacred mushroom and the cross sets out John Allegro's quest through a family tree of languages to find the truth about where Christianity came from. The back cover of the book shows a picture of a Christian fresco uh, showing the Amanita muscaria as the tree of good and evil in the Garden of Eden. His proposition is simply that the Jewish rabbi we know as Jesus Christ was the personification of a fertility cult uh, based on the use of psychedelic mushrooms, um, uh, in particular Amanita muscaria. So as I read this chapter about the star of the morning, it explained that the mushroom known today as the Amanita muscaria or fly agaric has been known from the beginning of history. Beneath the skin of its characteristic red and white spotted cap, there is concealed a powerful hallucinatory poison. The mushroom has always been a thing of mystery. The ancients were puzzled by its manner of growth without seed, the speed with which it made its appearance after rain, and its rapid disappearance. Born from a vulva or egg, it appears like a small penis, raising itself like the human organ sexually aroused and when spread wide its canopy, the old botanist saw it as a phallus bearing the burdens of a woman's groin. Every aspect of the mushroom's existence was fraught with sexual illusions, and in its phallic form the ancients saw a replica of the fertility god himself. It was the son of God. Its drug was a purer form of the god's own, own spermatozoa, than that discoverable in any other form of living matter. It was, in fact, God himself manifest on earth. To the mystic, it was the divinely given means of entering heaven. God had come down in the flesh to show the way to himself by himself. The morning and evening star is, of course, Venus. 
To appreciate the relevance of this luminary to the sacred fungus, we must try to understand its place in the astral system as anciently understood and the fertilizing power that it was supposed to wield. Each morning before the sun god withdraws his penis from the earth's vaginal sheath, a rival to the heavenly father slips in from the nuptial chamber and heralds the coming dawn. This star is second only to the sun and the moon in brightness and usurps some of their glory by lighting the eastern sky in the morning and holding back the veil of night until the moon rises. This star they called Venus, Juno, Isis or Aphrodite. As we may now understand, their names for star show that the ancients pictured these luminaries as penises in the sky, their light fancifully seen as the glow of the gland's fiery crown. At first sight, it seems then strange that these most powerful of all the stars should be given female names like Venus and Juno. The reference, however, is to the generative power. When the lesser penis of heaven slipped from the connubial bower before its master, it came dripping with the semen of the terrestrial womb. The sun, yawning and stretching its blazing path across the sky, would burn away the, the fragrant drops that his forerunner scattered. Until then, they would remain as dew on the earth, the most powerful of nature. From the writings of Pliny, its influence is the cause of the birth of all things upon the earth. At both of its risings, it scatters a genital dew from which it not only fills the conceptive organs of the earth, but also stimulates those of all animals. After the rising of each star, but particularly the principal stars, or of a rainbow, if rain does not follow, but the dew is warmed by the rays of the sun, drugs, med medicamenta, are produced heavenly gifts for the eyes, ulcers, and internal organs. And if this substance is kept when the dog star is rising, and if, as often happens, the rise of Venus or Jupiter or Mercury falls on the same day, its sweetness and potency for recalling mortals' ills from death is equal to that of the nectar of the gods. So it was when the Israelites awoke in the desert after an evening of filling their bellies with quail flesh, it was to discover that the spermal emission of the Jew had left behind it manna, the bread of heaven, which we may identify with the sacred fungus. In a very special way then, the sacred fungus was the offspring of the morning star, as Jesus proclaims himself to be the mystic. It thus had the unique ability of forming a bridge between man and God, being not entirely divine, not yet merely mortal. It gave men the power to become for a little while like the gods, knowing good and evil. Like the mushroom itself, it allowed mortal to become discori, as the Greeks understood that name of the sacred fungus, sons of God. The mysteries that the Jesus fungus could impart were heavenly in origin, since it itself, as the Hebrew name implies, is that which comes from heaven. The sacred mushroom was a being of two worlds, heavenly and terrestrial. Its affinities in the heavens lay with the stars, and in a special sense it was a child of Venus, the morning and evening star. The heavenly dew which this luminary was thought to disperse on the earth was considered of special power, and the appearance of the mushrooms on the ground at dawn seemed evidence of a special relationship between the star and the fungus. The heavenly twins, the Gemini or Discuri, were identified with the morning star, as is Jesus in the New Testament. So with this information from John Allegro's book in mind, since the publication of The Sacred Mushroom and the and the cross, a plethora of information into this subject has arisen. The book titled Astrotheology and Shamanism, Christian's Pagan Roots by Jan Irving and Andrew uh, Rudigit was the first to make a serious, serious examination of John Allegro's proposals. It uses iconography and symbolic evidence to substantiate many of John Allegro's claims and brings together years of research and hundreds of references, many of which have only come to light since the publication of The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. The, author, the authors dive deep into Judeo-Christian symbolism and mythology to, re, 
to reveal the true origins of Christianity in fertility cults and entheogenic drug use. They show with the use of numerous images, textual citations and etymological analyses how the symbols used in Christian art and encoded in sacred texts reference sacramental use of psychedelic mushrooms as well as ancient astronomical knowledge. Now, for those of you viewing who haven't already seen them, there are a multitude of presentations already on YouTube that detail the pagan origins of the Christmas rituals we have today and how they are related to the ancient European practices of shamanism and the mushroom fertility cult. If you haven't seen these, I suggest you search on YouTube for Magic Mushrooms and Christmas, and these will explain the relationship of Christmas, the Christmas figure Santa Claus to mushroom shamanism. So the takeaway from all of this information might be the suggestion that prior to the puritanical religious indoctrination of society by the Roman Catholic Church that instigated the period known as the Inquisition leading to mass genocide throughout Europe, ancient pagan cultures had used entheogenic plant medicines to attain direct access with an expanded identity and the wisdom of the higher self. Now, when discussing the effects that can be experienced with the ingestion of psychedelic compounds, we might do well to keep in mind the quote by Joseph Campbell that states, the schizophrenic is drowning in the same waters that the mystic swims in with delight. Although the psychedelic state or encounters with ego dissolution that lead to states of superconsciousness may seem as though they have parallels with states of psychosis, these induced episodes should not be mistaken for one another. And there may be some debate to be made about psychotic episodes being the nervous system looping or cycling through unresolved trauma, which can potentially be resolved through a state of ego dissolution, the process of death and rebirth. I will elaborate further on some of my own experiences with ingesting magic mushrooms and swimming and drowning at times in these mystical waters in another presentation. However, at the conclusion of this presentation, please be aware that the red and white Amanita muscaria mushroom cannot be eaten freshly picked like some other psychoactive mushrooms and can potentially be fatal if they're not firstly processed to rid them of toxins. Please take great caution and do your research before ingesting any such fungi and ensure that you have an appropriate set and setting, preferably with a guide, somebody who can keep you safe and preferably with some experience and therapeutic background. Always be safe. Thank you for listening. I hope this might contribute something to your own inner growth. And if you'd like to continue with more episodes of Future Self Dreaming, again, please hit the subscribe button. You can check out offerings on the website, futureselfdreaming.com and follow Future Self Dreaming on Instagram and Facebook. In La Keshe.